and welcome back to the NFL and you podcast everybody it's Friday December 4th and believe it or not we are finally in week 13 the final stretch of the regular season we've made it to December and man this is the point of the season where the tough get going and you either put up or shut up I am your host as always Hayden Bastard and I'm joined by the always fabulous Mr. Mark Hogan Mark how you doing my man I'm good Hayden thanks it's funny how each week that goes by gets scarier and scarier like I was complaining in week six that it was weeks and how did we get there already and you're saying it's all it's finally week 13 no one's been wishing it to be week 13 i'm scared <laughs> of the season ending yeah me too it's gonna be sad when football leaves but you know that old saying like this is the point where the real football season finally starts because the playoffs start heating up and division races get tight this is probably the most exciting part of the football season for me because it just gets so intense for everybody and we've got a lot of big games this weekend to get to and, and i honestly can't wait to talk about them to be honest with you well this is the thing like those Right, or the wild card races in particular, like, yeah, there's a bit of shifting happening atop each of the divisions. Mm-hmm. Uh, a couple of them are getting close to being wrapped up. I mean, Pittsburgh has its wrapped up, uh, Kansas City and stuff like there's there's no denying them at this point, but it is so congested in that wild card race. Like, what happened over the weekend was nuts that any team that needed to get a win got it. You know, the likes of the Minnesota Vikings and stuff that obviously we said that that was a game that was going to be an eliminator for either t- themselves or the Carolina Panthers. But um, even the likes of the Patriots and the 49ers, all these teams getting wins and it, it was clutch wins really. And it, oh, yeah. it keeps the, the race so exciting going forward. And it changes how, the outlook of a lot of these games this week as well, which is interesting. Oh yeah, absolutely. And we're going to get to every single game on week 13, but before we do, we want to give a big shout out to this week's guest picker, Jelani Brown from the, what the game means to me podcast. Uh, they do a phenomenal job of really looking into people and their experiences with sports and how it relates to their personal lives. And it's some really phenomenal stuff. So you should check it out wherever you get your podcast from. And you can find them on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at WTGMTM podcast. That's at WTGMTM podcast, what the game means to me podcast. And they're really fun guys. I've talked to them a couple of times and I'm very happy that they're on the show and to pick games with us this week. Yeah, I was thrilled to get in touch with Janani. So I don't exactly know when I followed him, but I think it was pretty recently because the stuff got, started coming up in my timeline. Mm-hmm. And I, I, in fairness, do give a lot of time to people that I see on Twitter, especially with the videos that they're putting up because we put up our own video and it's nice to get views and you're hoping that your content la- lands with someone. Mm-hmm. And I stuck on his live stream the other day and genuinely now I was like thoroughly entertained by his stuff and it was informative like we both know there's a lot of crap that goes through your twitter feed that you just wasted your time uh jelani's stuff was certainly not that like it was Mm -hmm. i mean i I hate to gush or whatever but i genuinely really appreciated the effort that he was putting in the knowledge that he was putting down and like for an example and i complimented him in the dm like he had a dm section or you could ask a question and I think it was his father asked about the NFC East or something. And I love that he's an Atlanta Falcons fan. And this show was primarily for the Falcons, but he flipped to breaking down Washington's defensive line, which we have done ourselves. And late in the game, the beginning of the season is when we, well, the week one preview, I flagged it as something that we should pay attention to. And Mm -hmm. I enjoy when there's other people out there that, they don't don't just talk about Terry McLaurin, which I know we do ourselves. Like that is what you talk about in the Antonio Gibsons, but there is people out there that have more knowledge than just that. And Jelani was certainly one. So I definitely check him out. Like you said, right. uh, what the game means to me podcast. He's putting out a ton of different like breakdowns and interviews and stuff like that. It's not just Falcons face. So um yeah, yeah, definitely go check him out and looking forward to telling you his picks as we go on today. Yeah, and we're gonna get to his picks, especially his Atlanta Falcons who will be playing in a Kind of big game a bit later, but uh, now we're going to get into the picks. Big shout out to Jelani for picking with us. And uh, Mark, you just mentioned a team there that you were talking about that I want to start the show with. And that's the Washington football team going on the road to take on the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I'm going to keep this one brief because there's a lot we don't know about this game, particularly because it was scheduled for this Sunday and then it got moved to this coming Monday in the early afternoon, not early afternoon, like five Eastern, if I remember correctly. And the Pittsburgh Steelers will be playing host after they get done you know, resting from their game against Baltimore uh, this past Wednesday. And I say there's a lot we don't know because 
I want to know what the Steelers are going to look like on four days rest. Cause that's what they're getting. They're getting four full days of rest Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Then they got to play a game on Monday. And you know, the, the Washington football team, they're not a slouch. You know, you just talked about their defensive line and we've talked on it all year long. They're a good group on that defensive line, but that pass defense is among one of the best units in the entire league. And, you know, you, you said you don't like it when people just talk about Terry McLaurin and Antonio Gibson, but that offense is starting to get under itself. I mean, you saw Gibson go off for three touchdowns on Thanksgiving and Washington take the lead in the NFC East for all of two days until the Giants took it back. I, I really feel like it's going to come down to the Giants and Washington for the division. And this could be a pretty pivotal game because I feel like the Steelers could potentially, you know, walk into this one, you know, not 100 percent because of the short rest that they're on. And I, I'm honestly going to put the Steelers on upset alert, even though that it's in Pittsburgh and it's against a Washington team that doesn't have a lot of wins under their belt. This Washington team is still frisky and they're still alive and they got that veteran presence of Ron Rivera and Alex Smith. It's just I, I just got a really funny feeling about that game and I can't put it into numbers. I can't really explain it quite well. I just I just think it could be troublesome for the Steelers. I really do. But I'm, I'm going to take the Steelers to win it. But if it's an ugly, sloppy, like low scoring defensive heavy battle, I, I honestly wouldn't be stunned. I really wouldn't be. Anytime that I've looked forward to Washington pulling it out, <laughs> they've disappeared again. So yeah, yeah. I, I agree that there's something strange about that game. And it probably just is the whole uncertainty around that COVID fixture with Baltimore that Pittsburgh had. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, like I want them to show up, but like I wanted them to show up against the Cincinnati Bengals and. They hobbled across the line, except for Joe Burrow uh, going at injured. They wouldn't have won that game, Washington, that is. So, like, yeah, I have them right now as m- number 16 in my power rankings, which signifies the winner of the NFC East, the, the ultimate winner. And right now I favor Washington because the Giants have been so hit and miss as well, even though that, uh, that offense would be better, that Washington has the ability to mo- be most consistent. What... It, it, it's, it's, it's still so hard to tell. Like, Ron Rivera, we give him so much credit, but at the same time, I don't think he's been aggressive enough at times. And, yeah, look, we've talked about it a bunch. We'll talk about it in the future. Alex Smith is definitely giving those wide receivers more of a chance. He's spreading the ball around more. There's more chemistry on the team, quite simply, that they do have a chance. Again, Pittsburgh will have that short week, but I, I'd still expect them to win it. Amen to that. And uh, our guest picker has gone with the Steelers as well, but it's just, it's an odd game, especially because, you know, it's been moved around so much because of COVID and that's just the season that we're in right now. And we'll we'll talk about the other games that have been affected by COVID a bit later, but I'm just saying it could get weird and I'm taking the Steelers to win it, but just keep an eye on that one. Just, you know, keep an eye on it out of the corner of your eye. It could get weird. I'm putting them on upset alert. So that's the Pittsburgh and Washington game. Mark, where would you like to go next? It makes sense to go into the Baltimore game. Then I suppose after that, I was going to talk about, the Atlanta Falcons, but it's almost too exciting compared to that <laughs> such a beaten up picture as as these are going through. So like it's tricky to talk about these games. Like I won't lie, because you know, like that Wednesday game was an absolute write off. There was so much chopping and changing that you can't read into it at all, really. Mm-hmm. Um like JK Dobbins and Mark Ingram were supposed to be back, and all of a sudden they're not back, and it's frustrating because I was looking forward to seeing J.K. Dobbins because he was coming off that game with 70 rush yards, which actually reflects 75% of the carries for the team. And I thought it was important that Baltimore found that guy that w- could be a focus of opposing defenses because like, they have been missing something like that. They have been missing a guy with a bit of attention. And I mean, I picked up J.K. Dobbins a few weeks ago on my fantasy team, kind of expecting, yeah, he would get to share the, the carries and stuff. And maybe that opens up the whole offense that if he's run one runway, one way, uh, Lamar Jackson can go the other. So I don't know. There's against Dallas. It's so up in the air, but one thing I think is worth pointing out at as that it actually could be good is Lamar Jackson. He's obviously missed Wednesday's game because of COVID because he got it so late, but like, I don't necessarily think it is a bad thing because what are the things that he's been coming out recently and saying like, He's saying that Tennessee wanted to win the game more uh, after they they lost them a couple or in his last game, I suppose. And um, that sorry that the the defense was calling out their plays was the other thing, wasn't it? That yeah, he comes out and he says stuff like that. So we say that maybe Carson Wentz could do with some time off. Mm -hmm. Why can't we say that maybe Lamar Jackson needs to reassess and just have a breather? And he's watching the game at home and he's like, "Yeah, I'm pumped up for this again." 
because look, it's easy to, to throw your toys from the pram when you were like record setting last year and you're MVP and now you're on the fringes of the playoff race because mm-hmm. I mean, it's important every win they have going forward. Now, what did we say like week four on this podcast that, Oh, we don't want to see Baltimore matching up with Dallas for the rest oh. of the year or teams like this, because, Oh, we know they're going to make the playoffs and it's mm-hmm. only a formality that they have to play these games and get there. But that's yeah. not the case. Now, every single win and game is important to Baltimore as it tries to, I don't know, battle with the likes of Indianapolis, who deserve probably to be in the playoffs, the Cleveland Browns, the Miami Dolphins. Like I said, there's an absolute backlog there of teams that can get in. And Baltimore is really in the, at the fringes now, you know? Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think maybe it's a good time. Look, treat it as a boy or whatever. We didn't expect uh, them to be, to beat Pittsburgh, so anything's a bonus, you know? So, mm-hmm. look... He's able to take the week off. Um, I should <laughs> mention uh, Dallas, of course, because this is my first time since week six covering the team, <laughs> or Hayden and I realized. So there's just three things I wanted to point out about it, basically. Jerry yeah. Jones is delusional with his quarterback antics, comparing, uh, what's his name, Danucci. Yeah, Gucci Ben Danucci. To what they had to go through with or in, in Denver. <laughs> I mean, like, he's he's the owner of the worst team in the NFC. He doesn't seem to realize that like you don't get the, you're not the worst team just because of your quarterback play. You had so much talent on that offense and it hasn't clicked. So like, he's going to have to you know, smarten up and realize there's a lot to think about come the offense or come the off season. Like, like who did, who do you put the blame to? It's not just on the quarterbacks. Now I do find it hard to point to Kellen Moore because I mean, he's not a head coach, but I'm going to mention Joe Brady's name later on the show, but like Kenna Moore seems to be a bit of a prodigy himself. So the offense should be working and stuff. You can't blame it on Mike McCarthy or maybe you can, who knows, but it, it's, it's just <laughs> difficult. Look, you had Andy Dalton there the last day and he had 75 yards for 50% completion rate. So you just can't just put it on the quarterbacks, even when they're in this offense isn't working. So sorry, Jerry, but I had to say that. Um, I do have to commend their aggressiveness the punt that asks on Thursday night football. Yeah. I like, I mean, it didn't work out and it was horribly executed, sure. but I think it was, it, it was worth going for. It made me and want an extra to vomit my Thanksgiving that, meal. Made, an extra point that I was going to say, how long ago does that feel? That was 12 days ago. That's the longest mini boy I've ever heard of. That, like they've had two <laughs> weeks now. They've gotten an extra boy out of all this fiasco. Honest um, to God, it feels but, like a lifetime ago. Honest to God. <laughs> That's that's crazy. That's twelve days ago. Since they are so well rested, and now they weren't able to scout Baltimore because Baltimore hasn't been playing in the meantime. It's about like, but one other thing, I don't know if this is going to go come more on the radar over the weekend. Hayden, this is going to be the return of Des Bryant. Des Bryant's going to be playing against the Cowboys. Well, this is phenomenal. I really hope he goes off. Oh yeah, same here. I I love Des Bryant when he was in Dallas, and I was so heartbroken to watch him go. But I, I, I honestly hope he comes in and catches three touchdowns for 150 just to show up the Cowboys organization. <laughs> honest, honest to God, I really, truly want that just because. Uh, listen, I, I, even if Lamar Jackson doesn't play, let's say if he continues to test positive for the virus, I would still take the Ravens to win with RG3 because he used to torch Dallas all the time. It only makes sense that he and Des Bryant would do it some more. I'm taking the Ravens to win. So it was our guest picker. It, it it, it'll probably be an ugly game because it's going to be another one of those Tuesday outings, but I, I expect the Ravens to win. Yeah, look, I expect Baltimore to win, of course, as well. Like, look, if Washington was able to do it to Dallas, what's stopping Baltimore from getting back and just looking good against them, especially they, I, I think it's a bit unfair, just I want to get off this game now, but I do think it's a bit crazy that they get the longer break between themselves and Pittsburgh. Like, yeah. I know that they were, they were supposed to have the Thursday game, after this, uh, sorry, how does it make sense that Pittsburgh only has the short week and Baltimore gets the long one? Listen, I maybe there's just some giant conspiracy by the NFL that they just hate the Steelers. Like that's what Steelers fans are alleging on Twitter. Like so, wh- why not? And I'm with you. It doesn't make a sen- sense at all. The, the original schedule was like they wanted to put them at the same time on Monday, and the NFL was like, no, 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 no. Let's let's put it on Tuesday so everybody can watch this dumpster fire. So. Yeah, I know. That doesn't make sense to me, but you're welcome to uh, bring us to another game. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. And Mark, I'm going to go to a team that right now I need to pick a bone with, and that's the six and five Las Vegas Raiders, who have suddenly lost two in a row 
going to the Meadowlands to take on the still winless New York football Jets. And Mark, you, you, you saw me last week. You saw me come out on this show and give praise <laughs> to the Raiders. I said, you, you won my respect, Las Vegas. I, I told you that. And what do you give me for all of that praise? You come out and give out one of the worst performances of any team the entire season. You get blown out by the Falcons. Josh Jacobs gets hurt. Derek Carr puts up one of his worst games, not just this season, but in a couple of years. You got turnovers out the wazoo. Once again, you got blown out by the Falcons. Have I already said that already? It, listen, I said on last week's show that that game could go either way and it could have been a shootout. And if the Raiders had just lost, you just they just lost, I wouldn't be upset. I'm upset because they look like an inferior team. They got bullied. They got bulldozed. It wasn't even a competition. And that's really what I'm worried about is that I waited so long to anoint them praise because I was so worried that it was going to be just like last season, that I would give them praise. And then in the last month of the regular season, they would fall apart on me. They would come out flat. And I'm so scared that it's happening again, Mark. I am absolutely terrified because I really wanted to buy in on the Raiders. I wanted to believe in them so badly and they came out and did it again. That game was so bad that John Gruden came out to the media after the game and apologized to the fan base. Do you understand how bad you have to play a game to come out and apologize to your fans? Hey, that, I'll put in. That's an old John. That's an old John Gruden trick. He does that every now and again. He did that after the last home game in mm -hmm. the Coliseum last year. He knows that that's to get the fans back. And so like, that's that's not my fault. That's what he's saying. He just dumps <laughs> it all on the players, throws them under the bus. He's, he's well versed in that one. Yeah. Listen, I'm just, I'm just so worried that they aren't who we thought they were. Cause you know, Mark's been saying it for weeks that they're the measuring stick in the AFC of determining how good you really are. I'm just so scared that they're just going to fall apart in this last month of the regular season, but pivoting to the game now against the jets. I mentioned that Josh Jacobs got hurt in the game against the Falcons. He tweaked his ankle and initial reports as of Monday said that there is a chance I put in air quotations around that. For those of you not on the video show, there is a chance he might play on Sunday. So if we're already at the point where we're saying that he might play or he might not, let's just for the sake of argument say that he doesn't play. Because if we're saying he's got a chance, that probably means he's not going to play. So let's say for the sake of argument he doesn't play. That means the pressure is going to be on Derek Carr, who just came off a god-awful game, to come out and really push the Raiders' offense forward. And he had been doing a pretty good season up until that Falcons game, so I want to give him some kind of slack. But the onus is going to be entirely on him to – take a run first offense and really try to pass the ball a bunch against the jets and the jets defense has been playing better and their offense. Well, I don't want to say play better because, you know, they just had that whole fiasco after the game of is Adam Gase calling plays on third down. Is he not? And then why is he lying about it? Like the, the, the jets are literally just creating problems for themselves. And you look at that team and then you look at the Raiders and this is a game that the Raiders should come in and dominate Mark. This is a game. The Raiders should come in and win by 20 to even 25. They're that much better than the jets. So I'm going to tell you this Raiders. If you don't come in and dominate, if you don't come in and roll this team that you are vastly superior to, we're going to have a come to Jesus meeting on next week's show about you. We really are because I'm not putting up with another flat December from your team. I'm not. But I, I'm also going to go with my uh, crazy man pick that I said I would start doing last week. I'm taking the Jets to win, and our guest picker is going with the Raiders. Oh, you're crazy. Yeah. I thought that this was just setting up to be, especially when you came in off the top and said, uh, you know what I did last week? I thought you were talking about the Jets and how you had <laughs> come to the realization that it's smarter to it. play oh. for the – which I did too early in the season. I obviously did it – with the likes of Atlanta, I stuck with them for too long. And sticking with the Jets seems even crazier, especially with a team that's going to be reeling like Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you brought up that I have them as my water meter for the AFC because, I mean, yeah, it's put them in a dire situation pretty much now. Just said mm -hmm. there's a backlog there in the AFC and they look to be the ones that are going to miss out. And it would be ideal for me if they were the number eight seed because it would really mean that they were the the gauge, like I'd said a few weeks ago. But that was shocking the other day. It was un or unlike them really to mm -hmm. bear down to Atlanta like that. And I'm going to talk about Atlanta after this because I feel like it's appropriate. But like I mean, the Jets have become a bit more competitive recently, and that's why we were giving them credit going into the Miami game last week. Yep. 
Um, but yeah, I, uh, Las, it would it would take an extremely flat uh, Las Vegas team to lose to the Jets. It, would. it also would be typical John Gruden TV to be the one to hand them the first dub of the year. What? Especially. <laughs> Especially after the the you know Kansas City, imagine losing to the worst team in the league, but you've also beaten the best. Yeah, yeah. next gen stats may look into that one for me. <laughs> when the last time that was done, yeah, I'm 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 playing it a bit safer than you are. Um, I best luck to you with that pick, but I'll I'll go, I'll go for Vegas myself. Listen, I'm a man of my word. I said I was going to pick the Jets until they won a game. I'm just going to keep shooting myself in the foot until they go 0 and 16 and make me regret everything. So that's the uh, Raiders and Jets game. No, I'm glad because I thought you were going to jump ship that fast, and I wouldn't blame you either. I thought, I thought this was you, or that was you saying it, <laughs> expecting them to win last week, and you could quickly get back off that train again. But you're stuck with them for potentially another five weeks. <laughs> and then, yeah, just put zero and five up on the board, baby. Zero and five. Let's get it. Right. Well, <laughs> we might as well bring it forward then to the Atlanta game. It was obviously what I was going to start with, but our picker uh, Janani, obviously, what the game means to me podcast. He got me thinking, and it was something that was on my head anyway, but like this game now by the bookies is a three-point spread in New Orleans' favor, but that just shows you like the belief that is there in Atlanta. Again, I'd hung on to it for too long at the beginning of the season because they should have been good and they just weren't performing, but now they seem to be getting a bit of that back, and especially that spark that they showed against Las Vegas the other day was amazing. They obviously have gone now four and two in the last few games after having that own five start with Dan Quinn at the helm but like the offense was never a problem yet it's scoring five points more now than it did then even though they had a like crazy game I think they put up the 40 points in Dallas and then the defense is conceding 12 fewer points which will speak to what Raheem Morris is doing but if you think that's a fluke or that it's been padded stats have been padded by the Raiders game I mean like the defense was giving gave up at least 30 points in four of the five games that Dan Quinn was still in there for and they haven't conceded 40 points or 30 points since in a single game. I mean, they, they tipped 27 one week, but other than that, it's 23, 24 point uh, concessions that they're giving up. So, like, what's that to do? Well, Reem Morris is just tough on, on them. I, I read there during the week that he, he's doing this thing in practice that's like yet one attempt at a drill because in the game, you only have one attempt to pull it off. So he's like, there's no mistakes. And that kind of intensity and holding players to account has obviously worked for Atlanta. And maybe that's what worked last year when, you know, Dan Quinn had that meeting and he kept everyone together and he said, let's go for it. And that intensity is what drove Atlanta out of having a really high pick because they were so horrible. But like, what's next? This to me feels like the Freddie Kitchens in Cleveland year when he went on that run with Baker Mayfield and ended up keeping him or they, he, he stayed in the job. But then it ended up that Freddie Kitchens wasn't the guy. And is that the same thing with Raheem Morris, that he's a good talent? But is he is he there for now when there's like this intensity and there's a lot of buy-in and goodwill? Mm-hmm. Or can he you know, bring it forward and be a successful head coach? I think it's definitely a tricky one. And listening to Jelani and asking him a bit more about it, he's a guy that feels like Raheem Morris could be successful in the league but perhaps it's better somewhere else because you kind of want to get rid of that culture in Atlanta, which right. makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, you don't want those inklings hanging around and I don't know, not about favoritism and stuff that's going around, but like it is tough when the same coaches are on the, the team. I was someone that wanted Dirk Cutter though, to take over the job just because or the interim job, not because he's a popular candidate, but because he had the, the experience and the play calling behind him. And importantly, he's an offensive mind. Mm-hmm that it wasn't the route that they went with it wouldn't have made too much sense whereas Raheem Morris probably that suggests to me that it is a bit of a trial run but can you back out of it I mean this is awful tricky when you give an interim head coach position to someone it's often very difficult to back out of that and say no we're going to go with someone else Jelani as well was pointing out the African American side of it and I think it's a tougher sell if he's overlooked for lack of a better word but I think maybe fans will be crying out for the likes of an offensive guru. And you're not going to get someone like, look at Matt Rule. He went to the Panthers as a head coach. He wouldn't have really done it for an offensive 
his uh, offensive coordinator position. I mean, Joe Brady is probably the only person that's going to do that at the moment because he wasn't a head coach in college anyway. So they got a bit lucky there. And obviously that's with Carolina as well. So I, I just think it's interesting the development that we've seen in Atlanta recently. But that, that all said, I think that New Orleans has really been clicking at the moment. And quite simply, like there's nothing to pick against them in this game. Like they just had target practice there for the Denver game over the weekend. Like and they, they got the run game and stuff going just because they could and they maybe, I don't know, were trying out some things that they certainly had the opportunity to. That yeah, New Orleans is too dominant right now to pick against them. Jelani, now in fairness, has picked Atlanta and I've nothing wrong with that call. Like I said, Atlanta's hot at the moment. Mm-hmm. But to me, you just have to go with New Orleans. It's just so much on the line for them. Number one seeds and all still in contention. Yep. That um, Yeah, I'm going for uh, New Orleans in that game. Jelani's going for Atlanta. And I think it's a really close game. As I said, the boogies have it at three points. Yeah, it, it's a really close game. And, you know, normally the, the Falcons and Saints usually play each other very closely with, with an exception being the game that they played just like two weeks ago where the Saints blew them out. If you're expecting that kind of matchup again where the Saints, you know, get like eight sacks, and the Falcons can't get any offensive movement whatsoever. I don't think we're going to get that at all. I would expect a much closer game this time around. I'm taking the Saints as well with Mark. So we're putting our guest picker on their first island of the day. So hopefully we can uh, catch up and finally beat a guest picker this week. All I ask though, usually go against us, Hayden. So I think we just picked up our first oh loss no. of the week. Oh and no. Like I said, Jelani seems like a really smart guy as well. He is. So I, out of all our uh, guest pickers, I'm really looking forward to seeing his because I know that we have quite similar... Uh, matchups as well this week I, I mean what what we're going to ultimately pick and um, yeah if, if we continue to lose it's going to be on a game like this which fair play to Atlanta if they do that listen all I ask Taysom Hill throw a touchdown pass that's all I'm asking for that's all I'm going to say yeah right just throw a touchdown pass that, that's all I'm waiting for so uh, that's it for the uh, Atlanta and New Orleans game it should be a good one should be a good one New Orleans needs to win to keep in first place like Mark said and Mark I want to go to a game that also has some head coaching questions around it and another close game, like you just said a second ago, because the four and seven Detroit Lions who have lost two in a row are going to Chicago to take on the five and six bears who have lost five in a row after starting five and one. And here's what I want to say about this game as a whole is that I think in a couple of years, people are going to look back at this game with some kind of different kind of uh, measurement, because I really feel like both of these teams are at the crossroads of their individual destinies, not just for the season, but going forward as franchises, and here's why I think that, and I'll explain why. I know it sounds weird, but give me a second. Let's start first with the Lions. In case you missed it, after getting embarrassed by Deshaun Watson on Thanksgiving for four touchdowns, the team fired head coach Matt Patricia and general manager Bob Quinn on Saturday. And that explains if you heard some kind of low screeching noise midday on Saturday, that was just the entire city of Detroit celebrating. And that's what they actually did. The local sports uh, radio station in Detroit was actually reading tweets from players celebrating Matt Patricia's firing. So that tells you how much he was liked in the city of Detroit. So uh, offensive coordinator Darren Bevel is going to take over for the Lions, a guy that I personally really like as a play caller. But it, it just goes to show that the Lions are staring down the barrel of a full-scale rebuild right now. And there's a lot of questions about, is Matthew Stafford going to stay? Do the Lions even want Matthew Stafford to stay? And more importantly, does Matthew Stafford even want to be in Detroit? So a ton of questions surrounding the entire Lions organization right now is they're literally about to start the entire thing from the ground up. And the rest of the season could potentially determine how that plays out, in my opinion. Now let's pivot to the Bears because they've almost got the same exact thing going because I mentioned that they started five and one and they've lost five games since then. The Bears are in a pretty bad state. And if you didn't watch the last Sunday night football game between the Packers and the Bears, I'll sum it up for you really quickly. The Bears got dunked on relentlessly. That, that's all that happened in that game. And then you got Matt Nagy, the head coach, coming out after the game and, and screaming about how this is embarrassing. The players need to take it seriously. The coaches need to take it seriously. I'm, you know I'm paraphrasing here, but I heard a lot of him just blaming other people and not really taking responsibility. You know what happens when your team goes out and sucks? It reflects on you as a head coach, Matt Nagy. I've heard a lot of him blaming other people for the problems on the team. And not once have I heard him step step up and take onus for it as the leader and the head coach of the team. So I'm saying that the Bears don't win a game in December, which is a very real possibility considering how bad they've played. I don't think Matt Nagy's job is safe in Chicago, and that shouldn't be a shock to anybody considering how the season has gone. That's why I say it's a crossroads of destinies for both teams is that 
so much is going on and so much of the future could be shaped on how the season finishes for both teams. But to the game this Sunday, uh, it, it, it's more of a case of which team do you trust more out of two bad teams that have literally given me nothing to trust for them about. I know Mark talked about it earlier in the season when the Falcons fired their head coach that there's not really a reason to expect the team will come out much differently after they fire their head coach. But I, I, I don't really know what to expect from the Lions. I really don't because they were just so flat and blasé under Patricia. I don't know if they're going to come out inspired because he's gone now or still be flat even though he's gone. I guess I'll take the Bears because I like their defense, but I really wouldn't be stunned if the Lions won this one. I really wouldn't be, but I'm taking the Bears, and so is our guest picker. All for the Bears. I'm surprised that this isn't going to be a split at all this game because I just find it so difficult to pick, mm. probably because I haven't been the greatest fan of the Bears since before <laughs> week one. But, like, I, to me, Daryl Bevel, yeah, he's really exciting and stuff, but that offense was clicking last year. Lost his mojo in the meantime, probably when around when Matt Stafford got injured and they didn't recapture it. So now if he's in as a head coach, like if his job wasn't really working to begin with or he wasn't executing and it's not, it wasn't really his fault. We kind of put it down to Matt Stafford, even though I think he is one of the most drops in the league that like it's putting a lot of pressure on the guy and he's been fantastic right back to his Seattle days and uh, Minnesota before that. they they do well to keep him in the building. But again, it's like what we were just saying with Atlanta there. It's like, oh, do you want to just have a complete rebuild and get not get rid of everyone, but who knows where the likes of him might end up, you know, if if he's able to leave kind of thing. Maybe he doesn't want to go through a rebuild. But yeah, it's it's that same point that you just brought up. If If a team loses a head coach, it puts a lot of uncertainty around that team going into the next couple of weeks and even though yeah you're um you this week this year we've seen examples of them quickly rebounding but i don't just don't see it for detroit like of all the teams that lost head coaches they lost their head coach not just because the head coach wasn't wasn't making them successful if you get me they were they're just a mess all over that's why you know matt patricia hung on for as long as he did because like you can point the finger at everyone it's just all over the place even uh, matt stafford he he has to hold his hands up and say like he he was struggling you know his feet were all over the place for the first mm. few weeks and yeah I, i'm siding with chicago based on pretty much that and that alone that i just think that detroit could be very messy that have they gotten their house in check mm-hmm. that fast uh, i don't think so and like you said chicago is the good defense and mitchell trubisky trying to you know keep his career alive and all like this that i, I just think it's safer to side with the likes of chicago yeah, it's, it's which bad team do you trust more? And I guess we're all taking the Bears on this one, a clean sweep. So that's the uh, Lions and Bears game. And Mark, where would you like to go next? I'm going to bring it to a game that's kind of completely unrelated, even though there's another one that I almost wanted to touch on. But it, next on my list, I had down the Cincinnati-Miami game. Ooh. And sorry to Cincinnati fans, but there won't be too much mention of the Cincinnati. Look, you're out for the year pretty much. Your quarterback's gone down. The bit of excitement <laughs> there is gone. Um, oh, and it's all about kind of Tua at the moment for Miami because we know that the defense is really good and we know that that's what's going to win them games. But he, again, is the starter if healthy. You know, if healthy, he's, as we record, we're not sure. I presume it's going to be Saturday or Sunday when we're going to know more about that Tom, but he's limited in practice during the week. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, why is it important for him to play? Well, look, Joe Burrow, the first overall pick and soon to be named offensive rookie of the year Justin Herbert they've been getting all the credit this year but it's Tua who's going to be playing in meaningful games and in terms of your development going forward that's obviously huge Mm -hmm. and how do we know they're meaningful games because if you're playing bad enough you'll get benched by Brian Flores like he did a couple of weeks ago so that kind of adversity and that kind of pressure is a good thing to have when you're a young quarterback and they can get him acclimatized to it so fast but it also begs the question, why are you doing that? If if in the NFL it's about winning and Ryan Fitzpatrick gives you the best shot at winning, why are you why are you switching away from that? I mean, like he's just less hesitant, Ryan Fitzpatrick. Tua has said it himself that he needs to stop waiting for receivers to get open. Because look, in Miami, those receivers aren't getting open. Like you can't just wait for the perfect ball the perfect play to open up for you you're gonna have to force it 
And that's why he bugs me when they're talking about he hasn't thrown an interception yet because it's like, yeah, maybe if he wasn't so tentative, he might throw that interception because he's not give, been given the chance. Like His yardage hasn't been amazing. We've talked about how the efficiency of the offense has dip, gone down since he's become the starter. And, you know, Ryan Fitzpatrick, he just knows how to get it done. I mean, Cincinnati is in the middle of pa- the pack for interceptions. So if Tua does end up playing, I would actually watch to see if he's true to his own word and whether he's a bit more aggressive and maybe he does throw his first pick. I mean, uh, Jesse Bates uh, is second, I think, in interceptions on the year so far. And Von Bell, those two safeties, they're a completely underrated duo. And like, as, in, as far as the running game goes, you're excited to see if uh, Miles Gaskin can come back. But like, even when he was in, that team was the third running or the third worst rushing the ball. Um, I have some stats there. Gaskin was averaging 3.9 yards per attempt. He's good as a dual trap, but he's only got the two touchdowns on the year and he's averaging 55 yards per game. So, I mean, people think that he's going to come back and that's going to help fix the offense, give it the kickstart that Tua needs. But I'm not so sure about that. Of course, I expect him to win this game one way or another, mm-hmm. even though it would have been a different story if uh, Joe Burrow was in there. But I think it's interesting what Miami is doing going forward. I again, would all be about winning and trying to make a push in the playoff versus trying to balance the development of your quarterback for the future, which, of course, is very important. Like You want to win at the end of the day. And we said all along there was no reason to take Ryan Fitzpatrick out unless it was about development. And it's like, right now, what trumps winning or development? I, honestly, I don't know because you're hoping that he's going to be around forever, this guy, Tuatungo Vailoa. But yeah, it's, it's it's a tough one to factor in. But again, it's the defense and special teams that's winning them games. So maybe it doesn't even matter what I'm talking about here. Yeah, listen, um, me and the guest picker are both going the Dolphins as well. I, I've been riding their bandwagon for a while now. And I, I really like what they're doing. And I just love the idea that Fitzpatrick got benched. And they said that what Jay Glazer reported on Fox after he got benched was that the Dolphins felt Tua was their best chance to win going forward. And now that they're in December and they got to win these games, Fitzpatrick is the one that's out there leading them. I, I just think that's so ironic and funny to me. You, you would hope that Tua gets healthy and he can come back soon for the team. But if, if they got to go with Fitzpatrick, he was playing great before he got benched. There's no reason to suspect that he's just suddenly going to start stinking up the joint. I'm taking the dolphins. And so was our guest picker. Let's go dolphins. Let's get ex- exotic in Miami and uh, make the postseason. It would be fun. They, if they of made. course need to the win. They need yeah. to win. That's again, they're part of that three Oh, or, quartet of teams that are getting stuck there so it's one of those wins that they're going to have to get so I hope Cincinnati doesn't throw any surprises our way you would hope I mean they did get frisky against the Giants and that was the Giants and we'll talk about that team a bit later but Cincinnati they're they're no slouch even without a quarterback you can't just overlook them can't look overlook any team to be honest with you all right so that's the uh Miami and Cincinnati game and Mark I want to pivot out of that game and go to I think maybe one of the biggest games of the entire weekend (laughs) And that's the 8-3 and three Cleveland Browns who have won three in a row going to Tennessee to take on the Titans who are also 8-3 and three and who have won two in a row. And this is a massive, in my opinion, prove-it game for the Cleveland Browns this weekend. And, and, and here's why. I need to see the Cleveland Browns come out and beat a good team. And, and, you're, and people are going to point at me and say, what are you talking about? They beat the Colts earlier this season. Yeah, that was a while ago. I need them to do it right about now. It's a what have you done for me lately league and what have they done for me lately? They haven't looked the best, even despite their record against winning teams with teams with winning records this season. The Browns are one in three, that lone win coming against the Colts, the three losses week one, a blowout loss against the Ravens, a couple weeks later, a blowout loss against the Steelers. And then most recently that horrible bad weather game against the Raiders where they just got out physical and out bullied. That's why it's a prove it game. The, the Browns need to prove to me that they can come out and beat a team that's above average and towards the upper echelon. And that's what the Titans are. They aren't great, but they're pretty good in most facets. So if the Browns can come out and steal a win from the Titans, that would go a long way in saying that, hey, the Browns aren't just back, but they can maybe win a playoff game because they're going to be playing tough teams like Tennessee if they make the postseason, which they're kind of in line to do right about now. And, and I, I really worry about them because the Titans, this is the point in the season where the Titans start taking off. They did it last year with Derrick Henry when he went on that monster run in December and he won the rushing title. 
And if last Sunday what he did against the Colts was any indication, I know the Colts were missing a lot of defensive linemen, and we'll get to that here in a couple minutes, but he psychologically broke them in the first half with three rushing touchdowns. He he literally picked the team up in the air and then squatted them down over his knee and broke their spine. He This is the point in the season where he takes off, and it's kind of a microcosm for Derrick Henry's entire season is that in games he'll lull you to sleep in the first half with these you know short runs where he doesn't look like he's getting a lot. But then as soon as the fourth quarter hits, he's a different animal and he's getting these six to eight yard runs. And then he's suddenly breaking a 35 yard touchdown run where he's breaking three tackles. He's like that at the end of the season. He just, he's going to go on these monster tears and he's going to put the team on his back and he's going to carry them into the postseason. It It's almost as good as a guarantee in my opinion, because he did it last year and there's no reason to doubt he's going to do it again because he's already shaping up to do it right now. And that's what I worry about for the Browns is that the Titans want to come in and take their lunch money. They want to come in and make the Browns eat dirt and out physical them. And that's a problem because the Browns, their go-to is the run game. They have the best run attack in the NFL. I've been saying that all season. And now that Nick Chubb's back and looking great, I can pound the table and say it again. They have the best run game out of any team. It's just so multifaceted and talented in that this is a perfect game. It's a true strength on strength matchup. What do you trust more the Titans heavy run game or the Browns heavy run game? And, and if you're a big fan of two teams that are going to probably be in the postseason with big winning streaks and they're just trying to enforce their will on one another, this is the game to watch. I'm going to take the Titans to win, but I just need the Browns to come out and be competitive. That's all I want to see. If they come out and get blown out, that's a terrible indicator on if this team is really ready to compete for a postseason spot and a wild card game. I'm taking the Titans to win though. Yeah, it's very important that they do play well because they kind of are playing down to their competition at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, the Eagles game, they're very described by that one. The Texans game, of course, recently against the Jaguars, though, they didn't have the excuse of the bad weather, which was the most worrying, I suppose. And mm-hmm. yeah, look, I expect Tennessee to have it as well. It's pretty simple. They're playing good football at the moment and Derrick Henry's being absolutely commanding versus like what Cleveland is doing just isn't convincing. And I think that's why the Cleveland Browns are so frustrated with their team, that they have all the talent and there's no reason that they shouldn't be having blowout wins. And it's kind of, they look like the same team that they always have. It's just they're coming out on the right side of the results. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. They often would have lost those games. It's a sign of a good team, of course, is to be able to come out in, in close games. But the way that they're doing it isn't convincing. And like you said, these are the teams that they're going to be playing come the end of the year. So they need to be able to beat them now. But, but as an aside to that, Indianapolis just lost heavily to Tennessee. And yeah, it was it sucked the confidence from them. But I don't say, or it wouldn't cause me to say that Tennessee couldn't beat them in the playoffs. So it's not a it's not a must prove yourself. I mean, who knows? Maybe they want to hold something back if they do meet them down the line. I don't know exactly how the uh, those playoffs are shaping up. Like, could Tennessee and Cleveland meet early on? But I, yeah, I, I would like to see Cleveland put up something, but I, I'm, I'm too blown away by what Derek Henry is doing. I previewed last week saying that he was going to do it in the second half, and that's when the two teams matched up so well Indianapolis' defense and Tennessee on the ground. And yeah, it was an absolute non event by the time the second half came, so it didn't even matter. Yeah, I'm, 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 st- I'm, I'm sticking with you with that one, Tennessee. Yeah, and our guest picker is also going Tennessee as well. But Cleveland, just show me something. Just don't get embarrassed. That's all I'm asking from you. If you if you come out and show me something, that's good enough for me. That's good enough for me. So that's the uh, Cleveland-Tennessee game. Mark, where would you like to go next? Midway through the show, as I have it now, we've, we're eight games in, and I think we have only one split. Am I right in saying that? You say one split for, the, for Jelani, one split for you. Because I wanted to take the Jets. You want to take the Jets. Man. Oh my God, these are these are some close picks this week. There's a lot on the line when they're so close. Are, are we all going Jets for 16 and 0 or what? The Jets yeah. are going to win it for me. Watch it. Well, one game that I think is hard to pick, and I'm certainly interested to see who you pick in this one, is a game like Cleveland and Tennessee, just the NFC West or NFC NFC West version of it this week. The Rams playing the Cardinals. Ooh. This game is more important to the Cardinals. I feel. They are coming off, what, a stretch of five games where they've lost four. And if they win this game, if you trust uh, playoff simulators, the New York Times are giving them a 71% chance to make the playoffs. But if they lose it, it goes down to half that. 
and the flip side of things the rams are all all but guaranteed to make it based on their simulation anyway so i think they dropped from 88 percent certain to 80 percent certain so do with that what you will Mm -hmm. but i mean yeah it's it's important for arizona to look good but they haven't looked good against the rams over the last few years since sean McVay took over they're six and oh the Rams over the Cardinals. I was unfortunate enough to be at one of those games myself. And I tell you, they've been pretty lopsided. The score on average has been 33 to nine Ooh. in the, over the last few years, which is just ridiculous. And when you actually think about that, like that, that's been over Bruce Arians, Steve mm-hmm. Wilkes and Cliff Kingsbury's regimes. So mm-hmm. it's not like he knows how to play one in particular. Like they all had their different defense coordinator, their different offensive coordinator, that it's crazy how dominant they've been. And I certainly hope that this is the year that Arizona can uh, pull it out because it is certainly going to be panic stations otherwise for Arizona if they lose another one. Like I said, their chances go to 35% of making the playoffs if if they lose this game, which is just too close considering they were in such command a few weeks ago. I mean, the, the offense for Arizona only has itself to blame. If they want to get right, to put it off the top, LA's defense, we've talked about it before, so to quickly... Uh, rehash it again their third fewest points third fewest passing fourth against the run like they're phenomenal so if you need to get right game for Arizona's offense this is an improbable one but it's going to have to because there's nothing wrong with Arizona's offense in terms of injuries and stuff and they have Clay Kingsbury there I mean yeah they lost Larry Fitzgerald to COVID but Mm -hmm. they they could have lost him to uh, father time long before this you know so the fans will tell you that they're not targeting Hopkins or to a certain extent Fitzgerald enough for their liking that Cliff Kingsbury is trying too much, I suppose. And he's just running the ball to run the ball on first down is another, like the, the play calling looks balanced and they're able to run the ball, but sometimes it's like you need to set up down the line for uh, passing plays and stuff. So if they have to get right, it's going to be a different one. Of course, there's this whole thing now, the narrative. I don't buy into it being a Cardinals fan and watching it the other day, the, the jumping offense. Oh, yes. Well, is that going to be that. against? Oh, like, I mean, it happened on a couple of plays. Now, the one in particular was extremely obvious mm-hmm. where they all just, the Patriots, this isn't that we can go and buy for anyone that isn't aware of it. They did literally just start jumping. Mm-hmm. And it was weird because, it, like, the pay, play was so slow coming out that I don't know how Kyler Murray forced the ball in any way. But I, I don't have the names of which players it was now, forgive me. But it gets batted up in the air and comes down for a pick. Now, if you're doing that, I don't think that's the answer. Because if you're jumping in the air, you can't catch up with Kyler Murray. It gives him an extra step that you've already lost because of his speed. So it'll be interesting to see, do the Rams come out and try that? I mean, they're such a good defense under Brandon Sadie anyway that they probably don't need to. Mm-hmm. But, but it's going to be, I suppose up to Arizona to see can they get back clicking again they've no reason not to be Kyler Murray is there DeAndre Hopkins is there they now have Kenny Drake and Chase Edmonds back it's up to them and it's up to Cliff Kingsbury to um, yeah start earning his money I think because defensive coordinator Vance Joseph is doing his job that's where the injuries are they're on the defense and he was able to like keep Cam Newton I know it's not a good offense in England but he was able to keep him to no yards the other day like whatever it was less than 100 and it's like city penalties is what cost them, and it's been costing them all year. And like, uh, I think so you have to put some blame with the with the offensive coordinator. I, I know people say no, it's up to the players. They know not to jump off sides and stuff like this on offense, and they're not to whatever on defense pass interference. They know how to. I I I just think that the coaches Vance Joseph is doing as best as he can with the pieces in front of him now. There's more safeties out this week and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah it's it's a huge game for Arizona within that division and yeah I, I hope they can pull it out so I, I'd like to hear your pick before I give you mine okay because I'm looking at our guest pickers pick and I'm like okay that's what he went full disclosure Mark I, I'm probably gonna regret this I'm taking the Rams no you're right too I, I'm glad I didn't influence I'm your right to really okay yeah no I mean the way that they're playing like the Rams, it's a conundrum what's happening with them that like they lose or sorry, they're able to um beat uh, or they lose to the Patriots or sorry, what am I saying? They lose to the 49ers. Yes. Who were able to figure them out. But then the best run defense in Tampa Bay didn't beat them. And it's like if their whole scheme on offense is based off the run game, and I have no problem with that. 
even though I, I think maybe Cliff Kings we can figure it out because he's all about that trickery himself and misdirection mm. and play action and stuff like this, that maybe Cliff Kingsbury is able to figure that out and give Vance Joseph a hat tip. But I think it was a, not a one-off. It's one of those Jared Goff games that he 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 just has, and we we all know and not love mm-hmm. him. And certainly, if you're a Rams fan, it's extremely frustrating. Right. But Jared Goff has made a career now on being so hit or miss in big games like that. And against the 49ers the other day, it just flopped for him. Yeah. And nothing worked. But that, that's like, why I'm scared. They, I don't trust them. No, but that's it. That's what I'm saying. Like they're still hot. And last week mm-hmm. I got super excited about them and said that we've been sleeping on them and stuff. So what? We're just gonna ignore them again because the 49ers who are coming around and we're gonna talk about them later. No, I think that someone one of us had to pick the Rams. Yes. I, I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't do it as a Cardinals fan because I know this game is so important, so I don't want to get any joy if they lose by mm-hmm. by saying that I, so I'm going with Arizona for this game. I yeah. think that, that that's a crazy stat about Sean McVay. I was looking at that back in May and I knew that the day was going to come that we were going to hopefully find out whether the Cardinals can get rid of that mm-hmm. freak of wins that Sean McVay has over him. Right. But you know, I'm sticking with Arizona, but I'm glad that you had enough sense to go with the Rams, honestly. I like the Rams. It's just that, you know, watching Goff go basically a great game on that Monday night against Tampa Bay then getting basically hammered down by the Niners. I just think that the Niners are just the Rams kryptonite. They've struggled against them the last couple of years. And Goff does have these games every now and then. It's just hard to trust him in these big games. You don't know what guy's going to show up. That's the only reason I paused for a moment. I've liked this Rams team all year. And I honest, honest to God, when I came into the show, I thought I wrote down Cardinals in my notes. And then I was like, oh, I picked the Rams. Okay, cool. Like, I didn't, I don't have any problem riding them at all. I really don't. By the way, our guest picker did go the Cardinals as well. So I'm on my uh, second island of the show. That's nice. I should have worn my Hawaiian shirt to go uh, island hopping today because that's what I'm apparently doing. So that's nice. So, Mark, that's the uh, Rams and Cardinals game. And the game I would like to go to next is a game on a bit of a smaller scale because the 1-10 in 10 Jacksonville Jaguars, who have lost 10 in a row, are going to Minnesota to take on the 5-6 and six Vikings. And I want to start off this game segment by apologizing. I want to apologize to the good people of Jacksonville because I was wrong about the Jacks. Uh, the last couple of weeks when I've previewed their game, I've been saying their defense is terrible. According to stats, the stats are, you know, looking at their season as a whole, say they're bad. Their defense is playing a lot better. You look at the Green Bay game and you watch them play, they're playing better. You look at their game against the Browns, they're playing a lot better. So I want to personally apologize to the Jacksonville fans. Your defense is playing pretty good. And I think that should go to say something about Doug Marone as the head coach that, you know, they just fired their GM and then maybe people are talking about Doug Marone might be the next guy on his way out. But Despite everything that's happened, they're a 1-10 in 10 team. They haven't won a game since week one, people. Despite all of that, their defense is still playing pretty well, and they're still in games despite everything that's happened. So I, I, I think that's worth at least something in my mind. Now, there, there was some question about who would start a quarterback for the Jags this week. Uh, at first, Doug Marone wouldn't say that Minshew would come out and start, uh, even though that he is apparently pretty healthy. But as of Wednesday, he said that Mike Lennon is going to start his second game in a row for the Jags. Uh, I'm going to be brutally honest with you, Mark. I don't care who starts a quarterback for the Jags. I'm putting the Vikings on upset alert either way. I just feel like the Vikings are just trying to throw away games at this point. You, you watch them play against Dallas. They were a better team, and they lost to an inferior one. And then you watch them play against the Panthers, and they're just trying to find ways to throw away their season. You know, they're muffing punts. They're turning the ball over. The only reason they got lucky is because they're playing a team that struggles to close out wins. It, I feel like the Vikings are just trying to throw away their season at this point. And now they're going to a frisky Jags team that has played some good teams close. They had the Browns close last week. They had the Packers close the week before that. There's no reason to doubt that this will be a close game because the Vikings are going to try to find a way to lose it. And I want to really focus on special teams because that's been the main problem for the Vikings. They've fired a couple guys. They've taken a couple guys out of games. They have struggled so much on special teams. And I remember vividly that punt return for a touchdown in that Packers game by the Jags that really kind of swung things open and allowed the Jags to get back in. If something like that happens in this game, I'm really worried about Minnesota's mindset of like, oh God, here we go again with with these special teams miscues. The only good thing that's going right for Minnesota right now is that Kirk Cousins has actually been playing pretty good. It's kind of gone under the radar lately, but his last two games, he's played pretty solid football. I know the one loss against Dallas and then, you know, can you really hype him up after, you know, he beat it? Carolina Panthers defense that isn't all that great to begin with but he's been playing pretty good and I think they're going to really need him to ball out this Sunday because like I said they're on upset alert I'm picking the Vikings to win 
but just keep an eye on this one. It's going to get weird. The, the Vikings, they just want to throw away their season is what it honestly feels like. I think you're just trying to get your own back for them beating, <laughs> or sorry, watching them play Dallas the other day. Uh, um, no, but look, they've had some Jacksonville, that is, they've had some really close games over the last few weeks. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, Houston, they lost it by a couple of points. The Packers, yep. they lost it by four points. The game over the weekend against the Browns, they lost it by two points. Those are better teams, you'd argue, than Minnesota. Mm-hmm. And you know, logic then says that it should be a closer game and perhaps they even go on to beat Minnesota. But I, I don't know. I'm not I'm not going to pick them. It's Aww. too hard to get behind them because, sure, look, they, they got blown out in the, in, in the middle of that stretch by Pittsburgh. And, like, yeah, the defensive numbers, I appreciate what you're saying there. And I'm actually glad you said it. Honestly, stats don't tell the full story. You do have to right. dive down a bit deeper than that. And yeah, acknowledge that they're a good defense and stuff like that. But I don't know, just too much on the line for Minnesota. Yeah. They're right there in the thick of things. Like, yeah, I picked Carolina last week and I was disgusted that they lost to Minnesota. But like, they were missing Adam Thielen. And I said that was going to be a large part to do with the game that when Adam Thielen, Je- Justin Jefferson, and Davin Cook are all in, it makes the offense click. And they don't have much of a chance, or it makes it a lot more difficult when they're not. So, without Adam Teen expected to play this weekend, I would give uh, the W to Minnesota. Yeah, I'm I'm picking the Vikings to win, and so is our guest picker. I'm just saying it, it could get weird, and I really wouldn't be surprised if it's a close game with three minutes left. That's just what these two teams have shown me over the last couple of weeks. But I just wanted to keep that one short and quick. And that's the uh, Vikings and Jags game. So, Mark, where would you like to go next? Well, we'll go to. Another quick one because it's an absolute stinker of a game, but I love the storyline going into it. Sunday night football with oh. Denver going to Kansas City. I mean, oh. for anyone that has missed this, Drew Locke's mom on Twitter is absolutely crazy. Uh, Laura Locke. I didn't hear about this. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, uh, so she come out or came out. She took umbrage with people calling out Drew Locke and the quarterbacks for blatantly showing disregard for any of the COVID rules and not like wearing their masks. Mm. Completely glossed over his mistakes. And just blindly defended him, saying that they went to the to the team and asked for the meeting because they didn't want to do it behind their backs, and that also oh, what they didn't have the the mask on. It's not their fault that they put themselves in a bad situation. And at the end of the day, Drew didn't. Drew Honey did not get COVID. So, and her words are, "We should interrogate the players that have gotten COVID <laughs> and ask them are they being safe." Which is absolutely, it's a real us for them argument. I was already going off Drew Lock because I was thinking he was a bit spoiled. And now I see why. His mom's absolutely crazy. <laughs> uh, you can, go, you can look, go look that up on Twitter for anyone. It's, it's a good, I don't know, three, four hundred words long of just pure fun and just craziness from his mom. I'm, I'm glad that I, I'm the first one to tell you because I was pretty shocked myself, Aiden, when I saw it. It's just like, I understand that. America operates differently under COVID and stuff like that. But like, I haven't been able to see my friends for six weeks because we're in total lockdown that we just came out of this week in Ireland. Mm-hmm. And she's patting herself on the back for staying in a hotel room as she travels the country, going to Drew's games. She says like, he hasn't gotten to see his, or he encourages his girlfriend not to go to the away games. I'm like, we can't even tra- travel outside a 10 mile radius in Ireland or something like that. Like mm-hmm. I can't go to Dublin, which isn't too far away from me because I'm not allowed to outside my county. So it's like, you're flying from state to state and asking your girlfriend not to stay back and you think that's okay. It's like, I didn't get to see my girlfriend for six months because of lockdown. And you think that that's, I don't know. I just thought her argument was so wacky that it's a, it was something to pay attention to from Denver during the week. But as an aside and to bring it back to Kansas City, they are the best team in football right now. Amen. They are playing fantastic, but they're still getting a lot of three-point games. Uh, they, Tampa Bay, Vegas, and Carolina have all been one-score games, which is crazy considering that they look so dominant, mm-hmm. but they're not having dominant wins. I mean, I want to see in this game what they can do. I want to see, can they blow a team away? Maybe focus on the ground game. Denver just gave up 229 yards and four touchdowns on the gr- ground. Can Clyde edwards helaire who was stopped versus Tampa Bay, I don't know if confidence is the right word, but can he get his mojo back? And, you know, can he just go off, honestly? And, you know, Tyree Kill there is... 
I don't know. We talked about at the beginning of the year, it would be the all pros. Mm-hmm. Um, we said Michael Thomas and DeAndre Hopkins. Now, Michael Thomas, because of the missed time, you'd rule him yeah. out. And is Tyreek Hill going to be the one to replace him? I mean, if you go by PFF, they think it's going to be Devontae Adams, then Justin Jefferson, Keen Allen, or Hopkins are the, you know, they're according to their stats. I don't know. Tariq Hill is just in the last few weeks. I would also argue, sorry, for DK Metcalf. Yeah. He just has so much. Coming full circle. Full circle, well, Mark. No, not at all. I mean, no, I just think that he's the big name at the moment. Like, I just mm-hmm. think it, it's just he's glowing and everyone wants to be of that heat off him. Um, but yeah, I think that with Denver being second worst in points allowed, should Kansas City run up a score on them? You know, they're a division opponent. It's on mm-hmm. Sunday Night Football. You're certainly going to want to look flashy. You know, pull your players with the third quarter kind of performance out of them, <laughs> you'd hope for. That, um, yeah, I think Kansas City win this one easy. I think, yeah, it was, it was fun. Thanks to Laura. Go look her up on Twitter for giving me something to talk about for Denver. But the rest of them is just... I love how Vic Fangio came out and just said it as it is. Even all the players... Oh, sorry, fans and all included think that Denver's game should have got called off last week. It was your fault. It was your player's fault. Take some accountability. I was very disappointed with his mom, honestly. Like, jokes aside, come out and saying that because, like, it just fuels that kind of, yeah, the us for them of it all. But, like, it just, it was just so nonsensical and disrespectful to the rest of society, honestly. Yeah, I, I'm sorry I was laughing, but I just I just like that this has now turned into the Moms and You podcast where we just burn Moms' Twitters. <laughs> it, it, you're right, though. It, it is irresponsible. And I remember that Drew Locke statement that he put out in the middle of the game where it felt like he wasn't even owning up to it, to be honest with you, which was kind of, you know, cruddy to begin with. Uh, I'd, say, I'd say his mom didn't even want him owning up to it. Like, clearly she saw nothing wrong because he must have been <laughs> ranting off to the side because apparently she knew everything to do with, like, mm-hmm that he'd right. done everything by the book when he clearly hadn't. If you weren't wearing a mask, you were in the wrong, whether you like it or not. Yeah. That It was just a bit of a crazy one, honestly. Yeah. Um, you're, you're right, though, about Kansas going to the game now. You're right about Kansas City's close games, and that that is kind of worrisome, but I'm not putting too much stock into it. They're still a great team, and they're still the best team in the league in my books. I'm taking them to win as well, and so is our guest picker. But, yeah, it, it would really go a long way in boosting their opinion around the league if they could just come in and put a 40-9 to nine burger up on Sunday Night Football. It really would. Just to uh, give reference to um, Jelani, obviously our guest speaker you're referring to, mm-hmm. uh, at WTGMTM podcast on Twitter. That's the uh, What the Game Means to Me podcast. And uh, like we said earlier on, look it up on Instagram and Facebook, like I did, and I'm, I'm, I'm definitely following him on Facebook and stuff now because it is good content. I just want to keep pushing him because, yeah, it's, just, it's good. It's good. Mark's so in love over there. It's, sorry, He's while here. I was doing that, I uh, went on to... So her her name. Laura, oh God! <laughs> You're gonna plug her Twitter. Ask Laura Lock Rocks. She's a she's the mother to a starting quarterback. And then if I, look, I'm not taking a shot at her. Don't get me wrong, but uh, that that sentence started off the wrong way. I wasn't gonna take a shot at her or whatever. I just think that it's. She should have been a bit wiser. She should have been a bit wiser. No, to go and read the statement. She should have okay. gone. Laura Lock Rocks, because you wouldn't automatically click on that one based on the Twitter handle if you went to search her, but that's the right. one that you go to too. Um, because it is interesting. Maybe people agree with it. But um, we're gonna we're gonna have all of Broncos Twitter haggling us over the weekend because we roasted Drew Lock's mom on the show. <laughs> Should I be good. So. I hope they agree. The people that are listening <laughs> that um, she was wrong to uh, make such I don't know a mockery out of a uh, COVID, but or according to me anyway. Uh, but yeah, let's let's move off it anyway. Yeah. It's, uh, it's not yeah. worth highlighting for the amount of time that we've done. Yeah, so transition out of moms and you back to the NFL and you. Uh, that's the uh, Denver and Kansas City game on Sunday night. And I would like to go to another big game in the AFC South, the 7-4 and four Indianapolis Colts, who we talked about a little bit ago, going to Houston to take on the 4-7 and seven Texans, who have won two in a row. And this is a pretty big game for both teams, Mark, in my opinion. I want to first start off with the Colts. We talked about it earlier with Derrick Henry psychologically breaking the team. And, that, and I really want to put that on the fact that the Colts were basically missing their entire defensive line and a couple other starters throughout the game due to COVID protocols, especially DeForest Buckner is one of them. The, the hope is right now, unless there is a setback at some point, that these guys are going to clear protocol and be good to go as of Saturday. So they should be able to play in this game. And the team desperately needs that badly because they just got flat out run over by the Titans. And right now they're only a game back of the lead in the AFC South. And with the Titans 
playing the Browns and we picked that game a bit earlier, if the Browns are somehow able to win that one and the Colts are able to win here, suddenly they're back right in the hunt of the thick of things not the hunt of things, the thick of things. So it, this is a pretty massive game for the Colts in that they got to stay strong, but their opponent, the Texans, they're white hot right now coming off that big game on Thanksgiving. Deshaun Watson has been playing incredible football lately. His last six games, you ready for this one? 15 touchdowns to no interceptions his last six games. He's on pace to shatter his career highs in completion percentage, interception percentage, and yards per attempt. He's playing some of the best football of his young NFL career. And I say all that, and then you've got to look at the fact that the Texans had Will Fuller suspended the other day for six games, so he's done the rest of the year. And they released Kenny Stills. They put him on waivers. So that hot, white-hot stretch that Deshaun Watson has been on, it's going to take a bit of a dive because now all of a sudden he's missing his best two pass catchers. And, oh, by the way, Randall Cobb, another one of their wide receivers, he's hurt. So who the heck is going to catch the ball for Watson? Darren Fells, their tight end, maybe? Who becomes their new number one for the rest of the season? It's kind of a – can you name the wide receivers for the Texans right now? I certainly can't. But if Deshaun Watson is continuing this you know, evolution as becoming a top-tier quarterback, that he'll do okay enough with these no-name guys on the roster. I, I say all that in that this Texans team is still playing good, and Romeo Cornell, the interim head coach, if they keep playing like this, he probably will be their head coach going forward, and I don't think anybody would really boo that out of the building because Romeo Cornell is such a good guy, and he's kind of universally liked around the league from what I've seen. So if the Texans can find a way to pull an upset in Houston in this one, it could go a long way in helping him you know, get that job going forward. But for the Colts, their O-line was banged up in, in that game against, uh, I don't know why. Tennessee. Thank you. I don't know why I zoned out. I wanted to say, like, the Broncos. I'm like, they didn't play the Broncos. Anyway, the Colts line, O-line was banged up, and the running game for the most part of the season has been hit or miss. I'm staring directly at you, Jonathan Taylor. This should be the game where that running game goes off. This should be the game where they rush for, like, 200 yards and three touchdowns. Because we've talked a bunch about that Houston Texans defense, their run game being so bad, that I hope that Jonathan Taylor has a breakout game, and he should be good to go for this one. Uh, I'm taking the Colts to win it, but it really, I think it's going to come down to the wire in this one. I just think the Texans are playing that well right now, despite their record, but both teams really need it, but I'm taking the Colts to win this to stay alive in the AFC South title hunt. It's too important for them to mess up. Like right. you're talking about Deshaun Watson. Like, is there any point even saying it anymore? We know how good he is, you know, and mm-hmm. it's exactly what we said at the beginning of the year. Now it happened probably two weeks later than we expected it to. We said they were going to have those tough teams. It's going to knock them out of contention. And then they were going to be able to play well. Like I, I would have almost given them a chance if Will Fuller was in, mm-hmm. I put in my uh, power rankings going that went out this week that it hurts me to say that I think that I've, Put, you know, pulled the plug on Atlanta and Houston because they're looking so good now that if we were in the season that is going to be expected in 2021 when we have an extra game, maybe they're able to, one of them would be able to pull off it's seemingly impossible after the first few weeks of the season mm-hmm. and make the playoffs. But like, it's just so tough that they had such a harsh beginning to the year with Baltimore and Kansas City, you know, it even wasn't Pittsburgh back to back to back. Indianapolis is in a way better place that they're able to you know, make the playoffs and to keep it short and sweet, yeah, I'm going for Indianapolis. It's big that DeForest Buckner's back, of course, too. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I'm taking, I know I said I'm taking the Colts. Uh, our guest picker is also taking the Colts, and I'm going to assume you're on the same page. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm going with the Colts. And to then bring it forward to another one, New England and the LA Chargers, which I think is interesting because it's the oh, tightest yeah. matchup according to the bookies all week. They don't know how to ma- match this one. They're giving New England it by a point. Ooh. The Belichick will meet, I think, his 25th rookie quarterback since he got to New England. One in five of those comes out alive, which is an amazing stat. Uh, if Justin Herbert was to pull this one off, he'd be joining company headlined by Russell Wilson, Ben Roethlisberger and Geno Smith as um, three of the five that have done in the past. Colt McCoy and Mark Sanchez have done it as well. Yeah. They beat Geno Belichick in their, in their first go-round as a rookie. But the interesting thing is, I suppose, like, can he come up with a scheme, Bill Belichick, for Justin Herbert, because that seems to be, you know, what he does. He comes up with the blueprint of how to beat these guys, and maybe he has noticed something in Justin Herbert's game. I think it'll be interesting because in stark contrast to Tua Tungo Vailoa, 
Herbert will throw near guys. Like we saw it against the Bills that he would throw near or in Tredavious White's direction, which was a bit of a surprise. So New England has a fantastic secondary, you know, Stephon Gale more Adrian Phillips is playing like a beast right now. The McCordy's and obviously JC Jackson, who's second in interception in the league. Like the Patriots have the scheme to do it. Mm-hmm. Or sorry, the players to do it and stuff. But it's whether Justin Herbert, you know, he's playing at such a phenomenal pace because he's, you know, playing, you know, he takes the throws and he's allowed to throw the ball and like he is that going in his favor. So it will be interesting. Will Belichick after putting a bit of a weird slant on what you do to Kyler Murray with those jumps that we were talking about, you know, does Will Belichick come up with something that will contain Justin Herbert? Because the other day, the Bills brought pressure on Herbert and it frustrated him for the first half. But come the second quarter, he figured it out and he was good to go and he was able to make that game close. I know obviously Buffalo had its weird turnover and stuff like that. But um, the Chargers for me, like we were giving them too many moral victories, which was great, but it's like there's only so many moral victories and close losses. And so I say, no, you know, go out and win. Not because you have to, but because you can. Like everyone's saying that they're too good for their record. We'll prove it and actually go and beat a team. Because New England hasn't got a much better better record than you have yourself. So with that in mind, I think I'm going for the charges in this one. I think it Whoa. is a, I think it's a bit of an upset, but like what I saw from New England the other day as they played the Cardinals wasn't that they were amazing. And I think that if this falls apart again, it's going to just be put on Anthony Lane that he's messed the game up once more. Sorry, Anthony Lane, if you're listening to this one, of course. <laughs> but, you know, he is obviously under pressure and how he's controlled the end of games has been abysmal. I know they talked about it on the Around the NFL podcast. We talked about it first because we've been talking about that for the last few weeks, you know, yeah. sporadically, obviously. But we have brought it up before. And that's they either run out of time or they give too much time or the Raiders game was I suppose a bit unfortunate they almost pulled the tough one off yeah I, I think that it's only fair if I go on an island I presume I'm going on an island now for this one but I said yeah if I'm going to do one this week I think uh, I'd make it the Chargers game I, I texted my Chargers friend Chris who I brought up before when I said they were playing the Jets and all he wanted was a Chargers win for his birthday and I was texting him after that game, and I said, this was probably one of the more mismanaged games I've ever watched in my lifetime, watching the Chargers play the Bills. That was I, – I truly have no idea what the Chargers were trying to do in that game. I, Honest to God, I don't, and I'm not trying to do a bit. I was just so confused at it. And I, I don't trust the Patriots' offense, and I just know Justin Herbert's going to put up points because he does it to literally everybody. It doesn't matter how good your defense is. He's going to uncork some kind of 50-yard touchdown bomb. So my main concern is, can the Patriots orchestrate enough points in this game to at least keep it close? And listening to you talk, Mark, I wrote down Patriots and our guest picker took the Pats. Can I join you on that island? Can I take the Chargers as well? You mind if I come no. on over? Quite simply, no. Okay, I'll, I'll stick with the Pats then. Okay. My preview. Now, for real though, <laughs> it, it, like the Jets put up 28 points in them. So you can definitely get your points. Um, To me, it's just... I think that, you know, it's nothing to do, for me, it's nothing to do with stats on paper. It's literally, I need to see Justin Herbert control a game. Mm-hmm. And, like, he hasn't been scared in the past when he's met Brady and right. Mahomes. So you're you're obviously welcome to join me. I, I'm, I'm worried that this will be the one that really stings when New England wins, and this is the cause of us losing to another guest picker. We're not losing this week, Mark. We're winning, and that's all that matters. So... <laughs> That that's the New England and uh, Chargers game. Let's see if the Chargers can finally hang on to it. The fate of the show hangs in the balance if they don't. So, Mark, <laughs> no, no, it's <laughs> my faith is gone. I'm tossing you, like I'm saying. Now you look after it, Hayden. I'm giving up. I'm saying that we can't beat these guys. They're too smart for us. I, we can beat them. We we have hope, Mark. We we can do it. I know we can. The Chargers just have to hold on to win a game. Oh God, we just can't do it, can we? Oh God. Okay, so. Uh, that's the Chargers in New England game. And Mark, I want to go to a game that has a little bit less stakes in it because the three and seven and one Philadelphia Eagles who have lost three in a row are going to Green Bay to take on the eight and three Packers. Now, full disclosure for this game preview, we're going to spend the vast majority of it talking about the Eagles. We all know what the Packers want to be. <laughs> Listen, we all know what they want to be. We know they're going to win the North. There isn't much that hasn't been said about the Packers at this point. All right. I want to specifically talk to the Eagles and the aftermath of that horrific Monday night game against the Seahawks. I want to start first with Doug Peterson. 
because what he said coming out of that game to the media, it, it truly made me want to chunk my phone. And I, I honestly couldn't believe what I was hearing that he gets up to the media and he tells them that Carson Wentz in the quarterback position isn't a problem for the team right now. And I, I know I'm paraphrasing. I know he said that the team has a lot of problems as a whole, and he is correct. There are a lot of problems everywhere on the team. But if you watch this Eagles team play and you tell me the quarterback isn't holding them back, you're flat out delusional. It, 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 like, I, I, I truly believe you're in la-la land. And, and the situation has gotten so bad in Philly that Mike Garofalo, the NFL Network insider, tweeted after the game that he can no longer say with confidence that Doug Peterson's job is safe. That's how bad it's gotten. Now, full disclosure, I want to say that I believe Doug Peterson is going to stay the Philadelphia Eagles head coach. But I just want to bring that up to show that how bad things have gotten in Philly, that the owner is sitting there looking at it, and maybe he doesn't have full confidence in this head coach that brought the team its first ever Super Bowl before. And, and, and you got Doug Peterson on the sideline, you know, some questions about the play calling. They're not really running Miles Sanders, and they're having Carson Wentz be, be the lead bell cow on Monday night. It, it, it's a lot of questions about the coaching in charge of the team. And then you look at the quarterback in Carson Wentz, who I, I heard this on – I know Mark mentioned the Around the NFL podcast earlier. They mentioned it as well, uh, Carson Wentz's historic regression. Well, Carson Wentz, in terms of the past three seasons, 2017 to 2019, this is from NFL Research, 2017-2019, is just on a historic regression from what he's putting up this season. His completion percentage has dropped from 64.4% the last three seasons to 58.1. Now that could be blamed on, you know, the lack of an offensive line and the lack of wide receivers, but let me continue, please. Passing yards per game dropped from 262, no, 260.2 yards per game to 231 yards per game. His yards per attempt the last three seasons, 7.2 dropped to 6.0. Touchdown to interception ratio last three seasons, 81 touchdowns to 21 interceptions, which roughly works out to four touchdowns to every one interception to this season, 16 touchdowns to 15 interceptions. And that's not counting the fumbles either. Then you have his passer rating last three seasons, 98.3 passer rating to 73.4 this season. Since 1950, Carson Wentz is the sixth quarterback and the only one under the age of 30 to have a season to have a passer rating more than 24 points below his previous three seasons average. The last couple quarterbacks to do that all retired that season. This is a historic regression under Carson Wentz. And yeah, there are a lot of problems that are contributing to the Eagles downfall. And no, it is not all on Carson Wentz. And I'm not trying to say that, but if anybody looks I think at this, you are, you must be with those numbers. That's pretty, pretty. Cool. Listen, let me finish. Let me finish. But, but for Peterson to come out and say that the quarterback isn't a problem is just a complete lie and, and is irrational and not based in reality because now there are stats and figures and tape to prove that he has regressed phenomenally. That's what I really want to point out is that this season is probably the worst for the Eagles in probably 20 or 30 years because of everything that has literally gone, <clears throat> sorry, gone wrong for them. And no, it's not all on Carson, but he has not helped. And that point that Mark brought up about Lamar – you know, it's good to sometimes take some time off. Wentz maybe needs some time on the bench to just clear his head. I know we've talked about that a bunch before, but Monday night was about as clear as evidence is needed. He's not just making bad throws. He's making bad reads. He's not getting the ball off where he's aiming it at. It, it's just all a problem. And now they're playing a Packers team that needs this win to stay in the hunt for the number one seed. A Packers team that's starting to get all of itself together and really start to gel this game is going to get ugly in Green Bay. I'm taking the Packers, and i be honest with you, Mark, I'm taking the Packers by 25 to 30 points. It's going to get ugly bad, real bad. Uh, 25 to 30 points would be monster. I can't see going that for myself, but I kind of want to come back with the cast man saying, look, I'm jaded, and we're all jaded of hearing how historically bad it is, but I can see where uh, Doug Peterson's coming from. Like He probably still believes that uh, Carson Wentz is going to be there quarterback of the future he probably is planning to stick around obviously past this year so he's obviously going to say that to you know instill some confidence and i do think that it's just a bad setup for philadelphia look like they're one uh, one win behind washington the giants and one ahead of dallas like why is their situation so dire and why can you pinpoint their situation so much yet no one else is able to figure out why washington new york and dallas is like how come you're giving them free passes and we're not looking for absolutely everything to be overhauled there? Oh, because Mike McCarthy's in his first year. Like, it's bad. 
it's just already bad. But like, it's it's just not happening. Like, it just hasn't clicked. And it's mm-hmm. simple as that. Like, I know everyone's everyone's going mad about Carson Wentz now. Like, oh, he's only ever had 15 good games in his whole career. And oh, he's never played the full season. Everything's coming up. Like, I know it's bad. I know they have Jalen Hurts in the wings. Like, it's a ride off of, of a year. Like, just because you're in the NFC East each year and you always are in with a shot of playing the playoffs. Like, I'm a Cardinals fan and it's, we've had some miserable years as fans of the Cardinals and like watching Josh Rose and stuff. I tell you, that was the start he bad. He could hardly connect with him. House. And I know that's what Carson Wentz, but like Josh Rosen was playing out of the league already that at least Carson Wentz has shown you something like go get him some receivers and go grade them. Then it's the same argument that has been made for Sam Darnold a lot that look, I'll, I'll give out about Carson Wentz in the future. I'm sure I'll give out about him over the next few weeks. I'm sure. But like, the whole like people need to stop being delusional and thinking that it's a perfect team outside a quarterback. It's not. Well, it's definitely not. So definitely not. Like you sold your soul when you got a, a a Super Bowl and you had a team to like look at the offensive line. Like we've said it since the beginning of the year. The offensive line is completely banged up. Uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Jason Peters. Yeah, has moved all over the line. Playing he with knows, a broken foot. Oh, he needs surgery. He's playing with a broken ankle, ankle that needs yeah. surgery. And it's like, you have to, you're being forced to put these guys out there. They're like 38 years old or whatever he is. Or I think he's 36. Uh, because it's like the last season, the last few games of their career, and they're just not going to go for the surgery yet. Look, there's loads gone wrong for every team in the NFC East. And everyone just saying that it's Carson Wentz. There's a lot more wrong in that division. Um, I'm picking Green Bay, that all said. Just yeah, the rock. So is our, so is our guest picker. I said all that, and I fully expect Carson Wentz and Doug Peterson to be there in Philadelphia in, in 2021, and they would be fools to get rid of them. I'm just pointing out that I, I just don't like it when they come out and say stuff like that. It's okay to criticize them. It really is. Like, you can take the Vance Joseph route if you want and just completely chuck your guy under the bus. Like, that's an option, too. You don't have to just blindly support him. That, that's what really annoyed me, and, and that's the Green Bay and Philly game. And, Mark, I think you have one game left, I, if I'm counting correctly. We, I, I, I do yeah and it's kind of an exciting game it's a big one for san francisco this weekend as they play play buffalo suddenly they've given themselves a bit of an injection in the playoff race mm-hmm. and you know to do to keep this train going against buffalo who i'd see is a poor man's rams honestly um, and i and I, that's that's not to say that they're a bad team but like right. the way that it's set up in terms of like their defense could work i, I get to an as well it's coming off the top though uh, this is going to be played in Arizona where, you know, San Francisco is going to base themselves out of there for the next couple of games just because Santa Clara has enforced some COVID laws, which is uh, good to see, but it's funny how you just uh, make the work around happen for that. But I'm kind of interested to see how this goes going forward because it's going to like be a training camp kind of vibe. They're going to be living up in a hotel, based there, doing meetings there, playing down the road or living down the road from the stadium that... I mean, it's only going to be over a couple of weeks, but it's interesting to see how it plays out. Raheem Mostert came away from the game almost crying the other day, saying how tough it is because he's not meeting up with his family uh, during this process. And all of a sudden, now they're going to all be living together. Who knows? It m- might work really well for the team. So it's uh, definitely one to pay attention to. It's just one more hurdle that the team has to contend with. It seems like just as the injuries are starting to thin out, their own, uh, their own county aban- abandoned them and uh, made them go look for another stadium. But talking about those, I mean, Richard Sherman, Raheem Moser, Debo Samuel all came back over the weekend. Uh, Brandon Ayuk will surely be coming back from the COVID list now and slipping back to Debo Samuel. Like what he did the other day, especially in the clutch and the game, whatever, just going for massive yards whenever they needed them. Um, even with Nick Mullins in their quarterback, it gave them a chance. And with Kyle, Kyle Shanahan looking after the team, I don't know. I can't write them off mm-hmm. just because, you know, we were able to, it was very easy to point to the injuries for a long time, but they've been scraping by. I mean, what are they at now? Four or five wins? I, I must double check it, but five like, wins, five and six. Yeah, five wins. Yeah, like they're only a game behind the Cardinals yep. and stuff like this. Like they don't have a great chance of making the playoffs based on that uh, generator that you can use in the New York Times. Looking at it earlier on, they still are at about a 20% uh, chance right now. But yeah, I don't know. I just have to give them a chance against the Bills. Like I said, they're mm-hmm. a poor man's 
Rams to me. Uh, but that said, we mentioned the run game last week and then they put it out of the bag and go for the 172 yards the other day. And Josh Allen started to move around a bit and picked up some first downs, which was crucial too. Obviously, their offense as a whole last year was the run game, but particularly what Josh Allen could pick up as he went along. There he had um yeah, the the better defense. And what is interesting is it kind of we said, Oh, where's it gone? Like that was their name last year was that they're really going on defense. Well, if you look into it, five of the last seven games they played against a top eight defense, which is ridiculous. So the, you have to give them credit there. Um, but through the rest of the season, San Francisco is the best offense that they're yet to play. And even San Francisco, they're they're ranked fourteenth at the moment. Other than that, the rest of them aren't even in the top half of the league. So, I mean, that's not too bad for them that the defense is just getting right and then they're going to have some easier opponents as they approach the, the playoffs. Hopefully hopefully for them, the edge rush and stuff can start going again. And, yeah, I think it's a very interesting game. Um, Buffalo is a smart pick. Mm-hmm. The bookies are giving them two and a half points, but San Francisco, Ooh. if they can get hot... Keep that going. I, I think I'm going for San Francisco um in this game. Yeah, I it was it, Let's I, go. I think yeah, I, I think Buffalo is the one to go for, honestly. Like I'm being mm-hmm. a bit too bold, and this is why we seem to I know jokes and so you know, this is why we seem to lose against our pickers. Like I'm probably being too bold picking the 49ers. Uh Jelani has gone for the Bills in this game, but I don't know, mm-hmm. it's just a bit fun and maybe I can go back to um being a bit of a, an I told you so kind of person when it comes to the Bills. Listen, um, I, I just want to point out that that the Fal- – not the Falcons, the Niners' main strategy here is just stay afloat until guys start coming back. And, and it paid off against the Rams as guys started coming back. You, you saw that they can still open up a can of worms on a team and beat a team that's better than them, and that's what the Rams are. They're better than the Niners, but the Niners can just beat them. So it, it's definitely not out of the realm of possibility that the, that the 49ers can cook up a game plan to beat the Bills – and if they can stay afloat, George Kittle is supposed to come back in a couple of weeks. So you well, get to, your... Oh, go ahead. Go with George Kittle's thing. Like, he was knocked out uh, first of November, mm-hmm. and they gave him an eight-week timeline, which would put it into January. But he's saying that he's doing it in six. He's being optimistic. He's one of those guys that have to give himself something to, you know, fight for or whatever. But to come back from a broken foot that fast, I know athletes and NFL athletes seem to do it so fast, but... They, the team isn't coming out saying George Kittle's coming back. George Kittle's right. the one coming out saying he's coming back. And we've seen with the 49ers and teams in the past that just because the player thinks that they're coming back, they're not just going to do it. They're going to think long term. So they, they right. would need to be in the playoffs to activate George Kittle. Okay, that's that's better to keep in mind then. But it, it, it just goes to show that that's been their rallying cry that if we can just get some guys back, we'll do better. And and the, this Niners team, they're still alive. They're 5-6. and six, And if they can beat this Bills team, they're – at a 500 level, they're in the thick of it in December with some tough divisional games down the road. They, they can make some noise here. And for a Bills team, the last time they were on this field in Arizona, we all saw what happened. We all know what Kyler Murray did to this Bills team. It, it, it's a perfect chance for the Bills to exercise some demons and, and get that last instance out of their minds. I'm going to take the Bills. It's a smart thing, but I'm with Mark. The, the Niners can win this game, and it is definitely within reach for them to do it and make some noise. It, it could d- definitely happen, people. Yeah, I, I again, I think it's a lot safer to pick the Bills, but maybe I'm just there trying to show a bit of faith in the 49ers if I'm trying to be unbiased and say, yeah, look, they, they have a bit of talent there and um, it's getting healthy. I think the more likely scenario is that Jimmy Garoppolo comes back, just Ooh, from what I have yeah. read, which would, I yeah, be shocking, really, I suppose. But um, yeah, that's for what it's worth, but we'll talk about that another day. I know we have one game before we get out of here. Yeah, I'm just going to hit this one super quick because the four and seven Giants, who have won three in a row, are going to Seattle to take on the eight and three Seahawks, who have also are on a two win uh, win streak. First and foremost, about Daniel Jones, uh, he suffered a hamstring injury against the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, at first, they were saying, "Oh, it's a super serious injury." Then they're saying, "Well, maybe it's not as bad as we thought it was." Point blank period, he isn't going to play this Sunday against the Seahawks, and he may miss a game or two after that. So it's something to keep in mind on going forward. And that really sucks because Daniel Jones was really starting to, I think, evolve just a little bit more than what we had seen for the vast majority of the season. He wasn't turning the ball over. Sure, he was still fumbling it, but he wasn't, you know, turning it over. So the baby steps here, people, you know, you got to give him credit at some point. So Daniel Jones won't play. That means Colt McCoy, the old Cleveland Browns quarterback, Washington football team quarterback, basically. 
Yeah, go Dude, ahead. As a rookie, beat Belichick, like we Ooh. said. Hey, there you go. There you go. Full circle, baby. Full, Full circle. circle. <laughs> he didn't look too good against the Cincinnati Bengals, and you can blame that on a lot of things, a quarterback coming off the bench. But the, the point is for the Giants game plan is this. Just play good defense and run the football and hope for the best. That's all you can really do when you don't have your starting quarterback. Let's talk a moment, quick second about the Seahawks defense because they've been playing a lot better the last two weeks against the Cardinals and the Eagles. They have held opponents to a combined 14 of 32 on third and fourth downs. That's 44% conversion rate and are averaging giving up 282 total yards. That's a far cry from giving up what they are on the season, which is 418.1. So their defense is playing a lot better. Their pass rush is coming alive. And I know a lot of people are saying, oh, they're starting to turn a corner. Oh, here come the Seahawks just in time for the playoffs. I think it's more about who they're playing. You got to remember that Thursday night game against the Cardinals. Kyler Murray, he did jack up his shoulder in that game, and it it was a problem throughout the game. And then, you know, the next week they're playing the Eagles, and we talked all about the Eagles' problem. So I think the defense is playing a lot better, but it's also being helped by their very, you know, cupcake schedule. And now they're being handed a team that's missing its starting quarterback in Jones, who is also their leading rusher. And it, this is just a perfect opportunity for the Seahawks defense to tee off. So if people start writing think pieces about the Seahawks defense being great, just tell them to pump the brakes. It's just who they're playing, but they also are playing good. Uh, I'm taking the Seahawks to win, and this should be a pretty open and shut case for the Seahawks to handle the Giants. Yeah, there's no right or no one has any right to pick against Seattle in this game, especially <laughs> with Dinah Jones. Of course, upsets happen and stuff like that, but I think we'd be crazy. Anyone would be crazy to be against Seattle right now. They have yeah. control of the division, and like I was saying earlier on, DK Metcalf the other day was an absolute animal again, so they have too much going for them. And the defense, again, Carlos Dunlop came in, he helped today big time. And yeah, Seattle looking good, so I'm picking them too. And Jelani, a, a sensible man, has also agreed with me on that one. Awesome. Sensible man. Yes, man. That, that's about as easy as a slam dunk as you're going to get in week 13, this one. So that's it for our week 13 preview. We just got through all the games and I uh, would like to thank Mark for stopping by and talking football with us. It was a pretty good show, right? Yeah, I hope so. Again, go <laughs> check out uh, Jelani if yes. uh, you're on Twitter or whatever. Uh, Ash WTG MTM podcast, uh, what the game means to me. Yes, it's good stuff. So please go check it out. And huge shout out for him to being the, being the guest picker this week. It really means a lot to us. So that's it for the week 13 preview show, everybody. Thanks for stopping by and watching. And we'll be back next week to talk all about week 14. That's Mark. I'm Hayden. And we'll see you here next week. Bye.